Okay, I'll just give you an introduction and then ask you a couple background questions and then it's basically you telling your experiences, the things you want to tell us uh, of your experiences while you were in the service. Wayne or I may ask you some questions in between. Okay. We're rolling. All right. Oh, okay. This is an interview, a home interview um, with G at, in uh, Del Mar, New York. It is the 6th of July 2006, approximately 9.30 a.m. Interviewers are Wayne Clark and Mike Russert. Could you give me, could you give me your full name? Date of birth and place of birth, please. Joseph W. Reds. Uh, date of birth, yes, sir. two eighteen in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Okay. Uh, what was your educational background prior to entering service? I had one year with uh, Alfred University. Uh, toward B.S. degree. Okay. After four years out of high school. Mm -hmm. Depression years. Um, did you work at all prior to entering the service? Uh, small jobs. Clerked in a drugstore and worked in a, a Van Rolf soap mill. Uh, Built boats one summer, row boats. Okay. Um, do you remember where you were and uh, how you heard about Pearl Harbor? I was at Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri, and I was just uh, going down to the uh, PX. What, what do they call it? Was it the PX or? PX, yeah. And uh, was somebody came out and said, uh, you coming in here to write a letter to your girlfriend? And I said, yeah. And he said, well, tell her you're not coming home because they just bombed Pearl Harbor. Mm -hmm. What was your reaction when you heard about that? Well, I was shocked and disappointed because uh, I had been told that I would be sent home for a week for Christmas, and that, of course, was washed out. Mm -hmm. Now, did you enlist or were you drafted? Drafted. And when were you drafted? Uh, middle of July, 41. Okay. Now, where did you go for your... Uh, Induction? Uh, Fort Niagara, New York. Mm -hmm. And from there they shipped me down to uh, Aberdeen Proving Grounds. All right, um, so did you take any tests? Is that why they shipped you there for ordinance or? Did I take any? Tests that they, they sent you there for ordinance, correct? Right, yeah. So did you take any tests or anything that they sent you there or they just send you there? They just sent me there. Okay. Yeah, they were holding me, uh, uh, a few of us, for uh, engineering, uh, Corps of Engineers. Mm -hmm. And they were filled up, so they sent us down to uh, Ordnance. Okay. Uh, what kind of training did you receive there? Well, <laughs> it's written up in the thing, mm -hmm. but... Uh, just basic training, basic military training, and then uh, training uh, on how to use tools and uh, just really basic uh, training on uh, that sort of a thing. Mm -hmm. I remember uh, they had some very, very good machinists there that were inducted, and every one of them went through the same thing. They were given a one and a quarter inch cube of metal and a file and told to uh, cut it down to one inch and see how closely they could get on that. And it took them a couple of days and they were furious that <laughs> they were stuck with something like this with their backgrounds. But 
Everybody went through it. Um, now you you were an, an instrument repair specialist. What kind of instruments? Uh, Non-electrical, <laughs> optical instruments, uh, binoculars, uh, aiming circles, everything up. To actually, we went up to uh, making some of the repairs on uh, all of some of the more f sophisticated uh, anti-aircraft aiming devices. Did you replace like lenses or or the gearing or taking the instruments apart and cleaning mm -hmm. them and uh, putting them back together and adjusting them to? Okay. Uh, now how long was your training? About uh, three months, I believe. Then where you were? Where were you assigned? Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri. Mm -hmm. What did, What did you do there? Just became part of the company and. Uh, uh, we did some repair work for the uh, uh, facility that we were in. Now eventually you were assigned to the Miracle Division. When was that? Uh, we left New York Harbor on January 20th, uh, 42. And uh, down through the Panama Canal and uh, all the way over to Australia, one week in Australia, and then uh, New Caledonia. And that's where our task force uh, gathered. And actually the Americal Division wasn't activated and wasn't formed until we got to uh, Guadalcanal, mm -hmm. and past Guadalcanal, actually. We were in Fiji when it was formed. Now, did you, you serve on Guadalcanal? Yes. Uh, Backup uh, instrument repair, uh, ordnance repair. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were there uh, under aerial bombardment every night. Uh, and uh, we were on direct line to Henderson Field. And about every night, the uh, Japanese Navy came in and shelled, and we could hear the shells going overhead and prayed that none of them fell short. <laughs> um, what were living conditions like in Guadalcanal while you were there? Uh, it was miserable. Mm -hmm. raining all the time, and I slept in eight inches of water a couple nights <laughs> while well, the air raids were going on. Mm -hmm just out in an open trench and everybody did. Did you suffer from any sort of tropical diseases or anything? Or? I had two cases of malaria, uh -huh. yeah. Any dengue fever? Or? No, well, that was the only thing. That... Okay. How about food shortages? There was a time when a lot of supplies weren't getting through. Did you have we always had shortage? enough to eat, but uh, it, it's usually the uh, uh, two canned uh, meals that uh, they would fix up for us. Uh, beef and, what was it, meat and vegetable stew and I don't know what the other one was. A uh, couple places we were able to get out and a couple of fellows went out and shot some deer, so we had venison for a couple of days. But uh, the food was plentiful, but uh, not very exciting. <laughs> <laughs> How long were you on Guadalcanal? Uh, about five months. Where did you go from Guadalcanal? Where did you go from Guadalcanal? Fiji. Fiji, okay. Yeah, that was uh, oh, about six months uh, 
Gresson Rehabilitation Center. What were some of your duties while you were there resting? Uh, well, we did some repair work, mm -hmm. but most of the time was uh, relatively free. Uh, everybody was given a week, two weeks, whatever they wanted to take of their uh, leave time. And uh, most of the fellows went down to the main city of Suva, but uh, it was crowded with GIs. Luckily, seven of us uh, got hold of a Fijian, uh, an Englishman that was working for Shell Oil in Fiji. And uh, he arranged for us to take a trip to a group of islands off Fiji. Uh, and a, a big native sailboat. Uh, it cost us seven dollars for the week, a dollar for each man. <laughs> and uh, we had a terrific time on these small islands off Fiji. Okay. Um, where did you go from Fiji? From Fiji we were shipped to Bougainville in the Solomons. Living conditions must have been pretty harsh there from what I understand. Yeah, it, at the beginning it was, but uh, resourceful GIs, we uh, had a sawmill. I don't know where they ever got it, but they had a sawmill and they uh, cut Philippine mahogany and we had floors in our tents and uh, shelves in the tents and so resources of our own. Uh, it wasn't too bad. Uh, now you ended up in the Philippines after that? From there we went to Leyte, mm -hmm. and from Leyte we made the initial landing on Cebu. Um, again, you were still involved in ordnance repair and so on? That's right, yeah. So when you went in, you went in after the, the beaches were secured and so on, or how close to the initial landings did you go ashore? Well, actually, uh, we were in probably the second or third wave going in after mm -hmm. the uh, uh, our, uh, infantry went in. But uh, when we did land, there was a terrific noise downstairs and uh, we had hit a mine right at the edge of the harbor. Mm -hmm. uh, one fella in our place got a piece of shrapnel in his rear end and he was the only casualty, but uh, the Cebu was pretty heavily mined uh, and uh, beaches were mined and uh, by the time we were taken in it was, uh, they had a path cleared off for us. But nevertheless, when we got in there, uh, we were in an area where there was a well. And uh, they came in and tested the water and they said it's perfectly okay to drink. And uh, over this well there was a hand pump there and over this well there was a wooden platform. Well, the wooden platform wasn't very steady, and somebody said, I'm going to steady this up because uh, somebody could slip and get hurt here. They took the platform off. The Japanese had put a 100-pound aerial bomb underneath it with the firing pin sticking up, and when they had put the top over it, they knocked the pin sideways so that it wouldn't go off. And we had been walking all over this thing. Oh my God. Uh, Hmm. Now, when, uh, even though you were 
Uh, in a non-combat unit, did you ever carry a weapon? Did you carry a weapon? Oh yes, we mm -hmm. always had. What them. did you have? We had. Uh, we started out with the uh, Enfield uh, 30 caliber, and I did my initial uh, training with that. And then later we got a uh, a smaller rifle, but we we always had a rifle with us. Was it the M1 carbine that you had? We had the M1 for a short while, but they uh, they had a carbine, mm -hmm. small carbine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did you have much contact with the people on Leyte in uh, Cebu? The native people at all? Yes. Uh, they were, they came in and uh, did our laundry for us and uh, at one place uh, Filipinos came in and brought uh, French fried shrimp, uh, which was a real treat for us and uh, we asked them what it would cost to bring these in a couple times a week and 25 cents per person. And I guess we had about 30 people there. But uh, somebody said, you're not getting very much money. And he said, Japanese would just take them without giving us any money. Mm -hmm. So uh, we had those people and uh, we hired uh, some people to work in the uh, ordnance uh, facilities too. Uh, and we hired some Filipinos to all the things like clean up the uh, area, uh, clean up the tents and things like that. And uh, I had a watchmaker uh, working in our group and in a couple of weeks uh, he said he wasn't going to work for me anymore. He was going to work in our main bivouac area. Mm -hmm. And I said, why? You get twice as much money here. And he said, yes, but I can't steal anything here. <laughs> <laughs> and that was it. They, you know, they'd steal pillows and uh, if they could steal a blanket, they'd steal that. Mm -hmm. Now, did you ever get to see MacArthur at all? No. No. What, what did you think of him as a general? Uh, we knew he was head of the army and uh, that's the way it was. He okay. just uh, accepted it. Uh, now you were in the Philippines until the end of the war? No, I uh, was uh, given discharge uh, July of 45. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. All right. Um, do you recall anything about the uh, dropping the atomic bombs and how you felt about that? I was at home at the time when mm -hmm. uh, that happened, but uh, just prior to my uh, return to the States on rotation, we had a big uh, get-together, a big meeting, and uh, somebody addressed us, somebody from outside of our company, uh, addressed us on what was coming up. There was something they called Project Hellfire. We were one of three divisions that was to go into southern Honshu, Japan, uh, as a diversionary thing before a main uh, uh, campaign into Japan. And uh, they said the total number of people is something close to a million that would make this southern Honshu uh, sorry, mm -hmm. and there would be no survivors. Mm -hmm. So, uh, when I heard that the atomic bomb was set off and that the war was over, 
I can see where they saved an awful lot of lives. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did you uh, ever make use of the GI Bill? I Yes, I had three years at Penn State and got my degree there. Mm -hmm. Did you ever use it to buy a home or anything also? Or? Uh, yeah, I guess our first home we did uh, use that. And uh, of course I still get uh, break on taxes mm -hmm. here from right. that. Right. Yeah. Did you ever use the 5220 Club? No. 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 Um, did you join veterans organizations after you left the service? None. Never no. did. How about any, do you ever stay in contact with anyone that was in service with you? Uh, just recently I had found uh, in one of the, well I get the AmeriCal Division News and uh, I saw the fellow's name and address in there. He's out in California. He was my tent mate. Oh really? Right mm -hmm. through. And uh, got hold of him and uh, we corresponded, and uh, he seems to be doing pretty well. Mm -hmm. He was an artist, and uh, how do you think your time in the service changed or had an effect on your life? Well, of course, it took uh, four years out, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and. Uh, uh, basically, it was a good experience, uh, especially since we were far removed from the uh, any real dangers. Mm -hmm. It was just one time that we had a close call, and when we were on uh, Bougainville, we had heard that the Japanese were planning a, uh, a push against us near the end of the campaign there. And uh, their main uh, sortie was to bring in some heavy cannon and we were told that it would be impossible for them to bring these cannons up within range of us because there was a river to cross and there were two steep cliffs that they had to go up and down. And uh, the Japanese just took the weapons apart and carried them up and down the cliffs and across the river. And uh, the next morning we were under bombardment, but we were told that it was what we were hearing was uh, our own anti-aircraft being used as an uh, artillery weapon. Mm -hmm. And uh, two of us fellows were standing in line waiting for breakfast and something went off pretty darn close to us and uh, a piece of shrapnel went between the two of us, hit the wooden post of uh, the tent that we were having our chow from and started the started that on fire. It was that hot. We got the heck out of there fast. Yeah. That was the only close call that I really had. But uh, it just went right between the two of us. Okay, well thank you very much for your interview. Well thank you.